This is actually syntax talk, not semantics, but the semantics is still last people who use handouts. So there's the handout. Hopefully everyone has it. Okay, this is kind of a haiku version of this talk. Um, I will try to give the big overview, the big picture, and some really cool facts that I think follow from this way of thinking about things. And the details are on the handout, and I really probably won't have time to work through. Just take my word for it. Of course, it works just the way I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of three main themes to this talk. The first is concerns two issues that were raised or discussed in, in GPSG, Generalized Phrase Structure Grammar. As you probably all know, Jeff was one of the co-authors of the GPSG book in 85. And the first question is whether or not a missing argument, as in, say, WH extraction, you know, typical gap or trace, whatever you want to call it, should be encoded in the same way as a kind of expected argument, as in categorical grammar. And I myself have gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on this issue for decades. And it's actually something I don't really have a dog in that fight, unlike most things. I actually don't have any dog in that fight. However, it comes out as okay with me. But I realized in looking at this material that it sort of came down on the side that uh, the GPSG folks were right in saying this was not really quite the same as kind of a missing argument, a sort of extraction gap uh, to the left is really something different, although you can use some of the same techniques. The second issue is, uh, which is not unique to GPSG, but was kind of factored a lot into discussions in those days, and it's something that's been around forever, is whether or not there's some kind of principle that gives effect, that gives the rise, gives rise to coordinate structure constraint effects. And many people have said for years that those are really pragmatic. And I'm gonna argue that that's correct, looking at some data that is not really mine, but sort of fit, uh, factors into this talk. And the third main concern that I have is I want to promote a, promote a view of syntactic categories that I actually heard about from Dick Early, um, which is to think of when we talk about function categories and categorical grammar literally as functions, functions from strings to strings. And they, they really are functions that term is often used metaphorically in categorical grammar, but if we think of them literally as being functions from strings to strings, we get some really nice results. So to elaborate on this, a sort of key insight in classical GPSG was that extraction could be done without loop intertraces. Um, the basic idea is if you take something like, and by extraction here, I mean left extraction, like WH extraction. So if you take something like the phonetician who we thought the department hired, the basic idea is that hired can be encoded as sort of missing something, uh, having an extraction gap if you want. That was called slash in the original GPSG work, slash being borrowed from the term in categorical grammar where slash meant a missing argument or an expected argument. But um, GPSG folks use that term, but didn't really mean quite the same thing. And, but the idea is that you can encode that something is missing via a feature and pass that information up. Um, that was a little different than the way slash was thought of in categorical grammar. So I assume, as a categorical grammarian, that a verb like hire is listed in the lexicon as missing, you know, as expecting two arguments, one in P, which will turn out to be the object, and then, uh, then the second, which is the subject. I also assume that the actual direction it takes things isn't listed case by case on lexical items. So it's listed in a kind of underspecified form, my slashes. Notation is not the same as marks, so slash is neutral between taking something to the left and to the right. And then there are directional slash principles running through the whole lexicon and specifying that you know, the first argument in, is going to be to the right, the next one to the left. That isn't listed on a case-by-case -case basis, but there are word order principles that will predict that. And I'm using subscripts right and left to indicate that. I, by the way, also believe that there's like infix slashes and circumfix slashes. What and in Bach called wrath. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I think there's more than just taking things to the right and to the left. Now, Mark Steedman in 1987 and many since suggested that those two slashes, the categorical grammar, I expect a certain kind of argument, and the extraction thing are really the same. And he proposed that uh, one way to think about this is to add to the grammar a uh, a possibility of what we'll call for now right composition or function composition, which says that if you have an expression that says, give me a B to my right to give an A, and then you find a B that wants a C to its right, they could just directly combine to give an A or C that is something that wants a C to its right to give an A. 
and the semantics of that is function composition. Uh, footnote, in my textbook in 2014 and various other places, I actually adopt this basic idea that I've argued for uh, breaking it down into two steps. One is called the each, Jeff will scream at me for using that terminology, but it's <laughs> standard in the field, or the G rule or division, which is really nothing more than a curried version of the function composition operator. It takes, it sort of just takes, instead of just directly composing, it takes something, turns it, maps it into another function that when it applies to something else, you get what you would have gotten if those two had composed. And I think that's right. But that will have no effect on anything I'm saying today. Everything will translate right over into that view. So I'm going to use function composition because it's just expositorily simple, simpler. So the basic idea is that if you, I need to say one other thing. If we have something like uh, the phone addition of Lee hired, I want to look at just the Lee hired part. I'm assuming that Lee can raise type lift from a noun phrase to something that wants to take a verb phrase to its right to give a sentence. Um, and that allowable so-called type lists that we have will also, particular ones we have will also follow from this particular view of syntactic categories. Typo version, take my word for it. Um, but the point is that Lee can have this fancy category which wants a VP to its right, an EP is something that wants an, um, wants an MP to its left, and that can function composed with hired to give Lee hired as a unit, as a constituent. Now, one of the beauties of this that has often been noted is that this gives right node raising for free. So if you have something like, independent of the question of how we do left extraction, if we have something like three, Sandy hired and Sandy fired, and Lee then hired the syntactician who didn't believe in X bar theory, uh, what we get is that you can directly compose Sandy fired as a constituent, which wants something to its right, Lee hired, as a constituent, which once <coughs> it's right, they can conjoin by the normal conjunction of likes, and we get this kind of right node raising effect. And I think that's the right way to think about this. So Mark used this also though for WH extraction, just said, hey, look, a WH word is just something that wants one of these creatures, okay? Um, in addition to this right composition, I assume there's the mirror image left composition, which just says that if something wants a B to its left to give an A, and it finds on its left something that wants a C to its left to give a B, they can compose and give something that wants a C to its left to give an A. This is just a mirror image of right composition. And David Dowdy in a really beautiful paper in 1988 showed that with type raising and left composition, you can get these funny non-constituent coordination things like Captain Jack serves lobster on Tuesdays and scallops on Wednesdays. Lobster on Tuesdays can combine up to say, yo, give me a transitive verb and I'll give you a BP. And similarly for scallops on Wednesdays, and they can conjoin. Okay. The claim I want to make is that these are the only two kinds of sort of freely available function compositions. Notice these just happen to preserve word order. And what I want to say is that's not an accident. If we really think of syntactic categories as corresponding to functions from strings to strings, it follows that these will be the only two possibilities. So Mark has argued for additional things called either crossed or mixed composition, which I just sketch out in A and B here, where you can get something that wants an A, which wants a B to its right, combining with something, a B that wants a C to its left, give an A that wants a C to its left. And I want to argue there could be language particular instances of this, but it's not freely available the way right and left composition are. And the reason is, because if you really think of syntactic categories as corresponding to functions, that would not be function composition. So what I mean by thinking of categories as corresponding to functions is, uh, what ha is that if we have, um, uh, say, an S wanting an NP to its left, okay, that's the category for choose go. That then applies to choose go. Really, these are categories from strings to functions from strings to strings, but that's just kind of an extra detail here. Once you get choose gum of this category, that's a function that maps literally the string Lee to Lee choose gum, and the string Gerald to Gerald choose gum, and so forth. And so literally think of these as being corresponding from functions to strings to strings. These order preserving ones, left and right composition, are the only ones that are really function composition. Nothing else is really function composition. And I want to say this view of categories is going to make some really interesting predictions. 
And the evidence will come from coordination. It will also show that the sort of extraction slash of GPSG is not the same as the categorical grammar slash. Okay. Um, so just to not conflate these two, I'm going to assume that we have a kind of feature passing mechanism saying I'm missing something. All a GPSG, I'll call that feature gap just to not confuse it to the categorical grammar slash, which means I sort of expect an argument. Um, and there's various ways you can do this. I worked out one here, but it's just the, the basic idea of GPSG that this information that something is missing passes up by this feature passing mechanism. Okay, because this, the evidence for all this is going to be crucially about coordination, let me say something about coordination. So I'm going to assume that both and and what is sometimes written, you know, written as a comma or silent and or comma and are the same except for what has phonology, one doesn't. And I'm going to assume that and is listed in the lexicon saying, give me some category X, then give me another category X and I'll give you X. Okay, so it takes two arguments of a certain category and returns one of the same category, taking them one at a time. And the general word order principles of English will say it first takes its argument to the right and then takes its next argument to the left. And that pretty much follows in almost any theory that, that has coordination broken down into a not flat, that it takes its arguments one at a time. I'm also going to be concerned with the so-called silent and that we see in week six. Jeff co-wrote the Cambridge Grammar of the English language, co-developed model theoretic syntax, and was pianist on the album hipster flipsters, finger popping daddies. Um, and what we have here is a chain of VPs, only the last one has the overt and, but if we simply say that the silent and is the same except with silence, and you have to kind of make sure that if you have a chain of these things, it knows it's and down there, because you get the same chains with or, and you want the semantics to come out right. That can be done with appropriate feature passing. I'll not give you that detail, but that's just, it's just a little complicated. Okay, I'm kind of talking fast, but as I said, this is haiku. So um, the next kind of question I want to ask is, is there a coordinate structure constraint? And this kind of was a big, bigly talked about when GPSG first appeared on the scene. There was this great excitement that initially people thought that wow, coordinate structure constraint effects follow automatically from coordination of lights because something that's missing something is encoded as a different category. It says I, I'm missing something and the other doesn't. That was the good news. The bad news was that when you really think about it, it didn't follow. And because of the way the slash passing worked, and that would be true both in categorical grammar or GPSC, it really didn't follow. That it should be, you know, if and takes two arguments, it should be just the same as think. It has the same structure as think. It takes something to the right and something to the left. And if it could be missing a gap in one, it shouldn't be any different for and and for think. So, however you want to do it, there shouldn't really be a coordinate structure constraint without something extra. And the good news is, I think that that's right. <laughs> there really isn't. And um, the argument for that, so this is a little distraction from the main point here, but let me sort of give that argument for that, uh, comes from something I'm going to call Lakoff chains. This is probably the only thing that George Lakoff ever convinced me of. Um, <laughs> and I really hate to give him credit for anything, but <laughs> he did have this very important insight. Actually, the argument I'm about to give is not the one he gave, fortunately. He, gave, he used these examples to argue for the same conclusion, but his argument was not the right of argument. <laughs> but the right argument with these examples is that you can get these sorts of chains, well, actually let me backtrack for one second. <coughs> it's been known forever that there are violations of the coordinate structure constraint. So you get things like, you know, what did you go to the store and buy? I mean, this is an old example. I think Kuno talked about these gazillions of years ago. Or how much beer can he drink and still say, still say, stay sober? Notice that in the first case, we have the gap in the right conjunct, and in the second case, in the left conjunct. But people have always sort of tried to explain these away and say, well, maybe they're really different. They're not exactly the same and. It's a second and, a subordinating and rather than a coordinating and. One problem with that is if you say and takes its arguments one at a time, it's always a subordinating and. You know, there's no difference. And the main thing is that the Lakoff chains are important 
because you can get these multiple things with these silent ands where you get these sort of mix and match of things with gaps and things without. So Lakoff's examples were things like um, in eight, what did he go to the store? No gap. Buy, with a gap. Bicycle home, no gap. Drink, with a gap. And then fall asleep. Perfectly good, okay. Or what kind of beer does he most like to go to the local liquor store, buy, hop on his bike to get home and then proceed to drink? So some of these things have gaps, some don't. And the argument that I think Lakoff should have made is that if there were really a different and for corded structure constraint <coughs> effects, uh, violations, there would also happen to be a silent version of that. And that's just a giant coincidence. Why should this new and also have a silent version? And and or both have silent versions, but they're the only ones that do. And you can see it with or and 10. What kind of car are you gonna buy, steal, or just give up and decide you need to walk to work for the rest of your life? So you get it with or and you get it with it. But if we had all these different ants to give rise to corded structure constraint effects, it would be kind of an accident that those also have these silent versions. So I assume it's the same ant, okay? So, so far, what I hope you will see is that um, we have these, what I'm calling Lakoff chains. By a Lakoff chain, I just mean these chains of things where some things have gaps, some don't, and you get the silent and or the silent or, okay? And I think that that shows you really don't want a syntactic coordinate and structure constraint effect. They come from some information, structure constraints that I don't understand. Nothing to say, new to say about those, but it's not really something hardwired in the syntax. So the first thing I want to ask now in the context of this bigger talk here is leaving aside the left extraction, WH extraction cases, which are all what I have on page five here, and these are the kinds of examples that Lakoff talked about. Do we get a similar effect with right node raising cases? Do we get something similar where we have chains with sort of right node raising where the thing is on the right? And the answer is we do. So we get something like we went to the store, bought, bicycled home, and then proceeded to drink two six packs of beer. That's perfectly good. Um, what's interesting though is um, with function composition, that will follow, and here's where I just have the details in the trees, but you, know, you can all take it home and study it, as I'm sure you all do. Um, we, we, this follows that we can get things like this. In this kind of case, what sort of launches the chain, we have bicycle tome and then proceeded to drink. I've oversimplified it, 12 to bicycle tome and drink. Drink, now, categorical grammar hat on here where we're using function composition to get these right so-called extraction or right node raising cases. Drink is, is something that says, give me an NP to my right and I'll give you BP. And has this fancy category where it says, give me something to my right and then to the left and I'll give you a BP. Those can compose. And what they give you is basically another uh, transitive, they give you, yeah, they give you a, something that wants an NP to its right to give a BP modifier. And then that can compose with lifted bicycle home to give at the end of the day the same thing that drink was. Something that wants, it's a VPRNP, something that wants something to its right. And so you can get these chains with that. That, once you've gotten that, so bicycle home, no gap, and drink can compose up to give you a fancy transitive verb. Once you get that, it can combine with either another fancy transitive verb, as in bought, by coordination of likes, or it can combine with a VP by the same process that you just went through. So you can get these chains where you either get things with gaps next or you get full VPs, and you can get this mix and match chain of VPs and VPs with gaps in this right node raising case. But, and this is the sort of punchline of the first question, is the extraction gap the same as an expected argument? It turns out that there is a constraint on this pro process, which is that when the whole process is launched at the bottom, the rightmost one has to be the smaller one. So what it, if, you, if there's no mixed composition, it's predicted that you can't get something like the picture in 13 here, where you have a VP at the bottom fell asleep, 
trying to conjoin with the transitive verb drink. And you can't get that because in order to get that, if you look up the tree, you're going to need mixed composition. And it has to do with the fact that Anne fell asleep, wants something to its left, but drink wants something to its right. And so they're not gonna be able to combine. So there's an interesting prediction made. Unlike in the Lakoff chains that Lakoff talked about with WH extraction, you can get this mix and match, gap, no gap, no gap, 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 any, any order of them. But in this sort of right node raising case, the thing that launches it has to be the smaller one. So you can't get the transitive verb conjoining at the very bottom with a full VP. And lo and behold, that's right. So the prediction is uh, borne out if you look at something like 14. Lee bought, drank, and then fell asleep two six and a half packs of beer. Now, if you get this at all, you're sort of forcing fall asleep into some transitive verb that you can have that transitive verb act on the six packs of beer, and that's the only meaning you get there. So you can't get this kind of lake off chain on the right. With a, you can get mix and match once you launch the chain, but the chain has to be launched by the smaller thing if there's no mixed composition. And that prediction is borne out by the empirical facts. Okay. So the first question I ask is, um, is the sort of extraction missing something by left extraction, WH extraction, and missing an expected argument, are they the same? And this seems to indicate, no, they're not. Because in the lake of chains in normal WH type extraction, remember, you can get this. So compare that to how much beer did Lee buy, drink, and then fall asleep, as opposed to Lee bought, drank, and then fell asleep, six packs of beer. So this suggests that these really are different. And if you use a feature passing, me passing mechanism, for the left extraction cases, then that will all follow. The more interesting punchline in terms of the idea that there's no mix, again, the moral as a category of grammarian, the actual moral I want to draw here is that there's no mixed composition. And this follows if you think of syntactic categories as literally being functions from strings to strings. What I want to ask is there's something equivalent to right node raising, but happening on the left, looking leftward. And it turns out there is. There's these cool cases that were discussed by Maxwell and Manning in a paper in 1996. Their analysis is totally different from the one I'm gonna give. Um, which are things like, it, uh, exemplified as 16. Jeff wrote, co-wrote generalized phrase structure grammar in 1985. The Cambridge Grammar of English Language in 2002. And recorded hand clap and foot stop and funky butt live in 1966. <laughs> So notice what's happening, you've got it conjoining these two fancy constituents, the Dowdy type constituents, and then those are basically fancy objects. And then you're conjoining that with something much bigger, um, the, uh, a VP or even a full S. <clears throat> we can get simpler cases like Jeff wrote books, columns, papers, and he was a rock star. So, or and was a rock star. So you can get NP, 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 and then like this much bigger thing, a VP or even a full S. <coughs> um, what do I have here? VP grow to S, yes. So we can conjoin a bunch of VPs with this silent and, and then at the very end have an S. Jeff writes books, teaches syntax, and he used to play in a rock band. So these are really kind of surprising. When I first heard about these, I thought, oh, well, that's kind of a problem. And then I realized it's not a problem. I remember they actually come out with no problem. Um, and interestingly, you can even get these kind of growing constituents with different subjects. So let's take 18, speaker A says, boy, Jeff and Joan, um, Joan and Jeff, sorry, <laughs> are both amazingly accomplished and celebrated linguists. And speaker B says, yeah, you're right, you know, Jeff is a fellow of AAAS, a fellow of the LSA, was the honoree of a conference in 2023, and Joan won the LSA Lifetime Service Award in 2022. So even, uh, I, I bring this up because there's some related literature on either, with or, this whole thing will extend to that literature, which says you need to have, when you have these kinds of funny chains, you have to have the same subject. That's incorrect. You can get them as long as there's a relationship between Jeff and Joan. Um, and there's some reason to be talking about them in the same breath. So what we have here is we have an NP, silent and NP, silent and VP, and S, and the S even has a different subject at the end. 
So you can get these really complex chains with this silent and. Now, first moral here is that you can get these just follows from having function composition. So if you get, and Joan was president of the LSA, I guess I switched Joan's Lifetime Achievement Service Award to her, one of her other great <laughs> notable things that she was president of the LSA. Those can, of course, go together to expect an S to its left to give an S. That's normal, what Anne does. But instead, it gets a VP. But a VP is something that wants an NP to its left. So by left composition, those two things can compose <laughs> up. No, no surprise. Those two can compose up, and you get a VP. Now, you need sort of more to show that you have a VP here, but the, there you go back to the whole chain, something like Jeff taught syntax, was celebrated in 2023, and Joan was president of the LSA. So S, then a VP, then you can have a higher VP, and so forth. You can keep up this kind of chain. Originally, I called this left node raising, and then I decided that it was not a very transparent term. So it's, it's parallel to the right node raising cases, and these haven't been talked about much in the literature that I know of. I, I've looked around, I've seen no references except this one buried paper by Maxwell and Manning, and they had a completely different analysis. But if you have this left composition, it follows that you get this chain. However, it's different than the rightward composition in that it has this really interesting constraint, which I call the grow only rightwards effect. So you always, if you're gonna have a bigger thing and a smaller thing, the bigger things have to be on the right. You can't mix and match them the way you could. In the right node raising, as long as you launched it from the smaller thing, then you could mix and match. And in the Lakelock chains, you can mix and match all the way, the WH extraction. But in this left-looking thing, you always have to have the bigger thing on the right, not a smaller thing. And here again, I just, you know, I've, I've got about three minutes, so I will just tell you this follows if there's no mixed composition. It kind of follows that you get more freedom on the rightward case than the leftward case because of the asymmetry of and taking its first argument to the right and then to the left. You could think that through if you're at all interested and see why that's true. But if there's no mixed composition, you can't, so for example, if we have a case where we have a constituent category A and then we're trying to conjoin that with an ALB, something like a VP. So take a sentence and a VP. A VP is something that's looking to the left for a subject. You can't do that, you can't get it off the ground because it would involve mixed composition to do that because AND wants its argument to the right, VP wants its argument to the left. And even if you allow that, you can't get it off the ground to the next thing because um, what you have now is something that wants something to the left. I think I made a, no, I didn't make a mistake there. Anyway, that would also involve mixed composition. So you can't get the same, you, you, the asymmetry, you, this gives a sort of row only rightward constraint. That is, you always have to have a bigger thing on the right, or the same thing, but you can't have something smaller that's looking to something to the left. And that follows if there's no mixed composition. So the question is, is this prediction correct? And strikingly, it is. So let's try it. Let's take something like Jeff wrote a column for NLLT, a book about GPSG, and performed an erotic rock band. Let's try to switch around a book about GPSG, which is a fancy object, and the VP performed an rock band so that we have the smaller thing, the object, to the right of the VP, and we get junk. Jeff wrote a column for NLLT, performed in a rock band, and a book about GPSG. Just no go. <laughs> uh, even cooler, let's try the ones we're looking at sentences. So Jeff wrote a column for NLLT, was a pianist on hand clap and foot stomp and funky butt live, and Joan was president of the LSA. So we have VP, VP, and S. Now let's try to just flip the S and the VP. It's a good sentence, sort of way, it's medium, but it doesn't mean the same thing. So if we try flipping them, we get Jeff wrote a column for NLLT, Joan was president of the LSA, and was a pianist on hand clap and foot stomp and funky butt live. <laughs> I have just promoted Joan to be the rock star. <laughs> if only. <laughs> if only. <laughs> so I call this the revisionist history interpretation. It surprisingly is good. It actually shouldn't be good. 
The reason it shouldn't be good is the structure it would have to have is of what I showed you on 24. And that noisy ant at the very bottom should not sponsor the silent ant up there because they're not in an unbroken chain. But people, I, I've checked these out with people and a lot of people say, yeah, they're not great, but they're not horrible. However, the reading I'm interested in, what you can't get for 22 is the same reading as in 22B has no reading synonymous with 22A, where Jeff is the understood subject of the being the pianist, okay? And that reading is shown in 23. That's the one where you have the VP on the right conjoining with the S on the left, but Jeff would still be understood as the pianist because Jeff would be the subject of all that. And that reading you just don't get. It's sort of crashingly not there, right? You're forced into the rewriting of history interpretation. This is one of the reasons I want to look at ones with different subjects, because if you have the same subject, you, you, you wouldn't be able to tell what's going on. But as soon as you put in a different subject, you see that you can't you have this row only rightwards constraint, that you can't have a VP and an S conjoining up this way. Um, and like I say, I don't know why it is good at all, but if it is good at all, it's not on that reading. So I think what this shows is that the empirical prediction is borne out. You cannot mix and match in these left chains that are waiting for something on the left. You can't have a mix and match of, say, a VP and an S or an object and a VP. You only can get the bigger thing on the right. That follows if there's no mixed composition. So to wrap up, um, the take home messages are that given that in the right node raising case and the abstraction case, in the right node raising case, you have to launch the chain by the smaller thing, and that's not true in left extraction. That seems to provide evidence that the GPSG folks were right to not take the sort of missing argument in WH extraction to be the same as categorical grammar slash, even though they borrow that term, um, which is fine in categorical grammar. I mean, you just have a feature passing thing. Um, I think all this stuff shows that there isn't really any kind of syntactic cord and structure constraint or anything giving rise to that effect, which actually is good news for everybody because everybody needs to say something extra to get a cord and structure constraint effects. And finally, and this is the part that is really the haiku version here, but if you do view uh, categories as corresponding from functions to strings to strings, from strings to strings, you predict that there should be no free mixed composition. That, in turn, predicts these very subtle facts about these chains of how you can get these kind of lake off type chains and sort of this wealth of subtle facts about, you know, you can get them on the left, but only they can only grow rightward. And um, that all follows if there's no mixed composition. So to my mind, reinforces the idea that I learned about from Dick early, I don't know that was his, that really when we talk about function categories and category of grammar, they really are functions. <laughs> They're functions from strings to strings. And so those are the take-home messages, which, sorry I talked so fast. <laughs>